Uh, okay, that's it, guys. Um, Richard, over to you. You can start now. Okay, Dave. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, very good to to see you all over the wonders of the internet. And um, delighted to be joining you for this kind of virtual conversation. Uh, and also, of course, with uh, with Ian and Sarah. Um, so uh, I, I thought I would talk for about ten minutes or so to set up the the topic. It's a very broad topic, but to try and narrow it down a little bit, and then uh, we'll, we'll hear from, from Sarah and from Ian and, and maybe explore it a little bit between the three of us and then open it up to, to all of you, and I'm sure the discussion will be the most interesting part, probably. Um, I, I guess I should say at the outset, I mean, firstly, it's a very broad topic, but I'm also conscious that the way we think about some of these issues uh, in the West and in the UK, where we are, and in America, it's very different probably from how some of these issues are playing out where you are in India and how they're playing out in other parts of the world, in, in Latin America and in Africa and so on as well. Um, but a lot of the issues that journalism faces uh, uh, in the digital age I think will play out everywhere but probably in different different ways and at different times. So we should just acknowledge that some of the things I'm sure we'll end up saying may not at the moment be manifesting themselves in that way where you are but nevertheless, there are issues that I think are going to affect journalism and um, uh, uh, journalists uh, all over the world in different ways eventually. Um, I thought I would just start off. Journalism in the digital age is the topic, and it's a very broad topic. I, I just thought I'd, I'd try and, and pick out five or six areas that journalism is being uh, impacted in the digital age and changed, uh, and explore those a little bit, and then open it up for, uh, for Sarah and Ian's views about it. And I suppose the first thing that I would uh, kick off with is to say that when we talk about digital technology and the internet and so on in particular, quite a lot of it gets talked about in a very sort of transactional fixed way. We talk about distribution on social media or we talk about digital news gathering or we talk about business models for journalism and newspapers and so on. But actually I think the, the impact on journalism of uh, the digital age is much more profound than that really and much broader than that and it's a deep cultural impact about what is journalism and about how people all over the world learn about the world and debate and resolve public and social issues between themselves as a society all of that is changing profoundly and that in the end is more important than whether you know you can upload pictures on your your phone camera or uh, what's going on, on Twitter there's a big profound cultural change going on about journalism in the widest sense and how we learn about the world and how we discuss and resolve political and social uh, issues between ourselves. One of the uh, obvious other ways that's changed I think and this is kind of leading on from that bigger thought is that um, for you know the last hundred years or more since the end of the 19th century journalism and journalists and news organizations have had a kind of a gatekeeper role and a fixed role. Basically news organizations have been ones with lots of resources. They can send people out into the world to find out what's happening and they have the resources to print newspapers or the transmitters to broadcast things at fixed times in the world. There's a morning newspaper or an evening newspaper or there was the six o'clock news and as the public you had to get your news at those times in the way that the producers decided worked for them as a commercial organization or as a a big industrial organization and that's been swept away so we no longer have fixed times now even you know, it seems very um, old-fashioned to even think in those terms and news people talk about it as a stream now it's constant there isn't a daily news cycle it's minute by minute moment by moment um, and in some ways of course that's a return to the past the pre-industrial age when news was passed around and gossip in the in the uh, you know the marketplace or wherever News used to be much more fluid and flexible like that. Maybe we're going back to something a bit more akin to that sort of uh, more fluid um, uh, uh, way of learning about the world and learning what's going on. But that shift from fixed times to a constant, always-on news culture um, has, you know, lots of other uh, impacts that go go through the whole business. Um, uh, one of the things, obviously, is we also, as part of that change, have more news now than ever before from more sources. Um, so, obviously, sources of news are mushrooming all over the internet. Quite a big argument about whether actually that's original journalism that's being generated or whether it's conversation about the same number of sources of journalism or maybe even in some ways a smaller number of sources of news gathering. But nevertheless, lots of ways of getting news are mushrooming, but they're not 
so much the kind of big corporate sources of news, they are much smaller and nimbler, uh, and I think that's more interesting as well, and, and we may talk a little bit more about the differences that that brings about, moving away from a corporate news culture to something a lot more fluid. Um, I suppose the other big thing that I think is happening is that news is polarizing, and I don't mean politically, although that is happening a little bit in some places, um, but the middle is falling out of news, as I like to say. So there's a big market for up to the moment news, and that's including on Twitter, but it's the news channels and it's on the web. What's happened this moment? What's the breaking news? And there's a market for specialist news and in-depth news, and increasingly for kind of longer reads, where people who say, actually, I'm really interested in this topic or in this place, and I want to really go and find out uh, in some depth what's going on there and hear from real experts in that area. And the middle ground in between those things, the general feature and so on, to a degree, I think is falling away. Um, now, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think that is happening in all sorts of places as a consequence of some of these changes that are going on. It's a real market up to the moment breaking news. It's increasingly a market in in-depth specialist news of various kinds. The middle ground is kind of falling away a little bit, and we might, we might talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and I suppose one of the things that, that comes out of that is that everybody, including these more nimble, smaller news operations that are starting up online, and you know you can think about BuzzFeed and Vice, but there are many, many others around the place, they're trying to find new forms of editorial value, and in the end that's how news organizations survive, by providing information in a way that the public value, and some of that is by aggregating uh, news, and it's by curating news, it's not always just by finding it out originally and, re and reporting it in a traditional way. And increasingly we're seeing people who um, do that and make a, a, a very strong role for themselves, and I'm thinking of uh, Andy Carvin from um, NPR in the States, who did it over the Arab Spring. We have a, a blogger here in the UK, Brown Moses, who is not a wasn't a, a, a professional journalist, uh, but has made um, a real niche for himself in examining the YouTube videos coming out of Syria, and has turned himself into an expert in analysing the weapons being used. And that's not his background, but he's made a specialist niche there, and has become a sort of go-to person on that topic. And so, you know, people are finding new ways of presenting value to the public, and if the public wants it, then they can you know, build a, a new career for themselves and a new way forward. Um, and I think also in that area of new value that can come out of the opportunities of the digital age, we can talk a little bit about community journalism, but I might leave Sarah to talk a little bit about that because she knows more about it than I do, really. But nevertheless, the idea that there's grassroots journalism coming up um, because the technology allows people access to the public space in a way that they never have before is, I think, a very exciting development. So all of that is out of the kind of shift from a fixed, you know, industrial model of news to this much more flexible, nimble, free-flowing stream of news that the, we currently all exist in. I think the second area to talk about briefly is news gathering, uh, and of course the citizen journalism. I, I personally don't like the phrase, but nevertheless it's well, well established now, and that calls into question what is a journalist, and there's a whole debate around that. I, I'm personally not sure there's a lot of value in exploring that, because I don't think it definitions matter that much uh, about what is or isn't a journalist. But of course the whole phenomenon of citizen journalists and anybody being have access to the media and provide content to the media is a huge change. Very briefly I'd say there's kind of four ways that happens. Uh, firstly eyewitnesses, people upload their pictures or email in I've just seen this or I've just witnessed this event. Now in a way that's always happened, the media's always used pictures from the public when they're available and they've always interviewed eyewitnesses, but of course the internet and the technology and phones are now allowed to happen on a hugely greater scale. But that's one thing that's happening in terms of citizen journalism and, and this big change in news gathering. Um, the other, another area is just opinion, Open, you know, obviously we see that on blogs, we see that on Twitter, that the public are able to inject their opinion and their views into the editorial debate and the journalistic debate in a way that they couldn't um, even sort of 10 years ago. Um, again, that's not new. We've always had, um, well, for, for many decades, we've had radio programs and radio phone-ins and letters pages in the newspapers. So there's always been a platform of some kind for the public to offer their opinion on the news. But now, again, it's exponentially bigger and greater and, and more uh, powerful because the technology allows them to do it on a much greater scale. Um, I suppose the third area I talk about citizen journalism and the changes to news gathering 
uh, are the extent to which news breaks on the internet. The internet is like a place uh, where things happen uh, and news stories happen and events happen on, online and on the web and that becomes newsworthy in itself and that may happen in debates and arguments between people or people uncover something that's happened but nevertheless the internet is a place that, that is being reported as a place and I think that's quite interesting. And then finally there's what gets called networked journalism based on the, um, the, the truth that whatever as journalists we try to report on the public, someone in the public knows more about it than we do um, because there are real, there's real expertise in the public and that may be specialist expertise, there may be uh, doctors and consultants who know more about health and, and, and medical issues than a journalist does um, but it may just be that people who live in a place know more about it than a journalist does looking from afar so how do we tap into that expertise in the public uh, and allow that to inform and improve the quality of our journalism because if we're open as journalists and open to that input then the journalism is only going to improve and get stronger and better and more accurate and more relevant to our audiences. So being open in that way to that kind of in input and expertise from the public, uh, we're seeing that more and more and The Guardian has uh, one newspaper that has this model of open journalism and using the expertise in its readers and its public as much as it can uh, and I think that can only improve the quality of journalism overall. I'd pick up a couple of other things on news gathering. I think um, Increasingly, uh, one of the things that's happened because of the digital age is that the old structures around the way news organizations thought of news are changing. So we used to structure news geographically, home news and foreign news, or you know, foreign correspondence about a particular country or particular beats. And I think that's breaking down and people are starting to report news more in the way that the public and the audience think about it and want it. So increasingly, news isn't organized around geography or isn't organized around what's convenient for the producers it's organized around themes so you know in a globalized world we're all interdependent and interconnected so uh, economics news and business news is not geographic anymore it's global and it becomes like a genre uh, climate change is not specific to geography uh, you know there are security is a, is a global issue so there are more and more issues that I think are, are being reported as kind of genres of issue if you like rather than carved up into what was a useful way of, of doing it as a as a news organization the producer and we're seeing more news organizations organize themselves in that way so um, courts is a, an online mainly business news organization based in the states that again changes its briefs and its specialisms according to what its audience and its public want uh, BuzzFeed is starting to organize they're investing a lot in original journalism now and in Correspondence, and they're starting to organize themselves much more around topics than they are about geography or, or the kind of traditional subject division. So I think that's quite interesting that actually being more in touch and closer to the audience as the digital age allows you to be changes the way that you think about the news and report the news. A um, couple of other brief points on news gathering. I think the other one other positive thing is we're seeing more use in international journalism, which is something I've looked at of local journalists and of freelance staff. Now there's, there's plus and minus to greater use of freelance staff and indeed of local journalists but I think from my old organization the BBC we are seeing Indian journalists report India which must be a good thing and African journalists report Africa uh, and therefore I think there's much more access to particularly global media now than there has been uh, for uh, a long time. Um, so, you know, the, the old, again, the old sort of industrial structures of news are breaking down. We're tapping into that local expertise a lot more uh, on a professional sense with other journalists as well as in, in terms of the public. Um, one other thing, I suppose, is what um, uh, a paper came out, I think it was last year, post industrial journalism from the Tau Center in America by Clay Shirky and Emily Bell and someone else who I can't remember. But in the end, the um, one of the main premises of that was that in this post-industrial age for journalism that I've kind of talked about at the beginning, you're seeing the rise of the individual over the institution. So the individual journalist who can offer real value, and Andy Carvin I mentioned before, maybe one example, there are lots of them now, is actually what people want. So they will go to a place to see that journalist rather than buy into the institution and the brand. And that's a, that's a big change that's going on and I think there are lots of consequences for 
for news gathering and and um, for organisations and indeed for individuals. And if you are really talented and you you're lucky and you make the break and you you become a kind of big name brand in yourself, then you have a you know fantastic opportunities. But of course, most people don't do that. But we are seeing more and more individual journalists become bigger than the institutions that they work for. So, again, in America, Nate Silver, who built a good reputation, you know, off the back of his use of data and statistics, um, predicted the American election better than anybody else. Has kind of transferred himself and his team from the New York Times to ESPN, and he is a brand in himself, and just looks for a different institution to sit in for the moment with his his team and his expertise. So those are some of the big changes in news gathering. Just run through two or three others very quickly, and then I'll come across to, uh, to Sarah and to Ian. Um, distribution and marketing. People talk a lot about social media and the news. They are. We get our news from social media. Personally, I think social media is largely about distribution and marketing. When people say, I get my news from Twitter, what they usually mean is, I clicked on a link that someone put on Twitter back to a news organization. So Twitter is the distribution mechanism. Uh, there isn't a lot of original reporting coming through Twitter, is the thing, obviously, but a lot of it is linking through to news organizations. So Twitter and other social media, Facebook and other things become a means of distribution and a means of marketing and, and creating interest in what you've got. And I think that's a lot of the value for, for news and social media at the moment. Um, just briefly, uh, at the end, I think one of the, we talked about the cultural changes that the digital age has brought to journalism. Uh, uh, one of those is a far more open relationship with the public and with the audience. Uh, and when I was still at the BBC, I used to say to people, that journalism itself is not enough anymore. You have to show people what's gone on behind it. You have to lift, lift the bonnet, lift the lid on the journalism, show why you've done certain things, why you made certain judgments in certain ways. And being transparent and open about the journalism is what generates trust in the organization uh, and trust in in, in that particular story or whatever it may be and, and therefore that's becoming transparency in that way is becoming increasingly important to, to trust which is crucial for journalism and to accountability and all institutions are having to learn to be more accountable than they, they necessarily had to be uh, in the past. Uh, so that cultural openness in terms of transparency and accountability as well as an openness in, in the way that you conduct your journalism is a big cultural change that I think a lot of um, traditional news organizations struggle with. Certainly the BBC struggled with it and still struggles with it as a news is traditionally a very sort of top-down command and control operation. You have an editor and a news desk and things spread out from that, but actually we're having to become a lot more networked and a lot more flexible and a lot more open. And that does create cultural problems for news organizations trying to organize themselves and reorganize themselves. So there's a big market for consultants in advising news organizations on how to reorganize their newsrooms reorganize their processes. There's a very interesting memo from the editor of the Financial Times recently on how he's reorganizing the Financial Times, getting away with the morning meeting because that was all about newsprint deadlines and they recognize it's now all about digital times of day when people choose, choose to, to tap on the ft.com. So they've reorganized how they discuss and manage their journalism, they've reorganized the newsroom, they've reorganized the times of day and every news organization is having to think about that, how they reorganize their processes, their physical newsroom structures in order to meet this new flowing stream context for, uh, for news. And then very finally and briefly before I come across to, uh, to Sarah and then Ian, uh, business models. So, you know, everyone in the West is worried about business models for news. Uh, less so, I think, where you are, less so in South America and, and other areas where print is still booming and you have lots of news channels that are, that are successful and so on as well but certainly in Europe and in uh, the United States there is a real crisis in the business and economic models for news largely caused by classified advertising disappearing by audiences declining as they have more options to go and get their news in other places and the combined effect of the loss of advertising and the loss of readership or, or viewers has undermined the, the basis of commercial news now we've seen lots of local newspapers in particular fall and that again plays into the the opportunities for community journalism and new hyperlocals, but I think we are starting to see the corner turn a little bit. We're starting to see revenues come up. We're starting to see big news organisations understand how to make money out of the digital world as they go mobile, as they um, uh, play with uh, uh, paywall models and that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of experimentation going on. But I do think we're starting to turn the corner. And the story of oh, the collapse of newspapers and the collapse of the news industry, I think, will start to shift over the next couple of, of years and 
there'll certainly be fewer big newspapers and there's a consolidation going on, but I think by and large you're starting to see news organisations work out how they can survive in what is a very, very difficult, different context. And part of that is about getting their model right around paywalls and subscription. Part of it is about understanding how people use their services and the use of data and the data they can get in the digital environment can really inform the products they produce and how they distribute them and what they do with them and uh, and have to inform business models and so on. So they've had a few years of, of understanding all of that and I think the corner is turning there. So I've talked for, for quite a long time there and run through you know half a dozen areas that I think are, are quite interesting about what's happening to journalism in the digital age. Um, but uh, I'd like to open the conversation up now and um, uh, maybe Sarah, can I come to you, come to you next and, and and see what you think about that? Or indeed, I'm sure you have more interesting thoughts of your own. Okay, thanks, Richard. Uh, it's a really uh, good overview of, uh, of the situation, um, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming along to this session. And I think I'd like to just start by saying what a great time it is to be a journalist, and what a, a fantastic time you're joining uh, the ranks of journalists. It's, um, digital has really opened things up so that it's very refreshing and invigorating new approaches coming along all the time. Um, to introduce some of the, the work that I get involved in, um, it tends to be in the area that people call citizen journalism. Although I'm a professional journalist, I've got a newspaper background, um, a lot of what I do is now helping people Use, use digital tools to connect with other people. And that's a, a different thing, actually, to journalism. And it sometimes surprises journalists that people that use a lot of these tools, use uh, social media, use blogs, and take pictures, make films, whatever they do, they might not actually be wanting to be journalists. Um, just because it involves publication, it doesn't necessarily uh, follow that the people doing it want to be journalists. They actually want to connect with people. Um, digital has, has given everybody the ability to make really powerful connections and ways to get things done in their communities. Um, but we're going to talk today really about, the, about journalists and about journalism. And some people have obviously taken the opportunity of digital tools to set up their own, basically their own news services. Um, like Ian is going to talk about the one he does for his local community. And there's various reasons in the UK that that's kind of um, mushroomed, really. Um, part of it is that there are towns and villages and cities where the mainstream media is not interested any longer. Maybe it's too expensive to be able to put people uh, you know, on the ground, as it were. Um, we've seen here, as, as Richard referred to, a sort of centralization of production of newspapers. And so quite, quite often, they can now be sort of hundreds of miles away from the, the communities that they serve. And so communities don't really see them as, as part of, of their fabric anymore in some places. And so, in, in those areas, people, you know, have set up new types of journalism and um, are, are undergoing different sorts of uh, reporting as well. One of the big things that um, we were involved in last year uh, in the UK, and at the moment, as things stand, you're not allowed to film in uh, public meetings of local councils, so the people that make decisions about what gets done. Um, in a town or, or city or and um, you have to at the moment if you wanted to go to a meeting and, and tweet about it or take pictures or film it or record it on audio you'd need permission from the local council and so in some places the council don't give permission mm -hmm. and this has been a big sort of movement across the country of people that run these uh, local websites who wanted to be able to show local decision making. Doesn't sound terribly controversial, I realise, um, but that's that's where we were at in the UK. This has actually progressed um, to the point where um, the Minister for Local Government for that local uh, decision making in the UK was um, urging people to go out and film and tweet and get involved and was actually using his own Twitter account to say, yeah, go you know, film, do. Um, and there has been some sort of conflicts around the country. And I think 
this has now led to there's a, a bill progressing through uh, the government here, uh, which will give people, all people, not just journalists, all people the right to film, to blog, to otherwise record uh, the local decision making. And I think it's really important to note that that movement really was led by people who want a better expression as citizen journalists, people who are interested and want to make a difference. And actually, there aren't any newspapers that I know of who campaigned on this issue, um, but the, the actions of these citizens will make it uh, possible for newspapers to also get involved in this uh, activity and for them to be able to produce um, reports from local decision making for their audiences as well. So I think that's been a very important thing in the citizen journalism environment in the UK. Um, how it translates to your uh, local decision making, uh, I don't know, but uh, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about that later. Do you want me to continue, Richard? Or? Uh, no, okay, well, then why don't we pause there and go across to Ian and then we'll, we'll loop back again and then open it up to uh, questions. Is that okay? Yeah. So, uh, so Ian, over to you. You're on. You're on mute, Ian. If you can unmute yourself. What a what an amateur, what an amateur I am. Right? Is that better? And I see my uh, is my name back to front as well. Is it? Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, uh, Sarah. That that builds, I think, a, a terrific uh, picture. Um, Maybe if I can just pick up a few things that um, I've noted down uh, about my perspective, and I think for me uh, there are um, essentially three things that, well, there, there's many things that that, that uh, has uh, digital has changed about journalism. But first of all, I think it's changed the way we all consume news. Um, I uh, taught a class. So one of my roles is as a, a university lecturer. So after we, um, I teach undergrads and postgrads, and I met uh, my class of undergrads for the first time this week, and uh, I asked um, three classes, uh, so about 100 students in total. Remember, these are all uh, 18, 19 year olds, uh, one well on, on media courses, so considering maybe a career in media, and I asked them uh, how many of you bought a newspaper in the, the last week. And out of those 100 students, one student put up his hand um, as uh, the only one who bought a newspaper in the last uh, in the last week. Now, I, as Richard said, that may be very different where you are. I know that um, newspapers are are in good health in uh, in India and, and other markets, but certainly where we are, that generation we've lost that generation in terms of print products. Well, in certainly in terms of print newspapers, I, I still have some faith in uh, print, um, but in terms of daily newspapers, uh, we're going to see that, um, I think, uh, at some point disappear uh, into the ether. And um, the other thing I would say about the way we consume news is that, uh, well, two other things, the influence of our friends. Richard talked about um, social media being uh, a distributor of news, and I, I agree uh, with that. But <laughs> Uh, having a, a, a big influence on what we decide to read. So whereas uh, when I started uh, in newspapers uh, 20 years ago, um, you bought a newspaper and uh, you would start at page one and you would look, uh, you go page two, page three, all the way through to the back of the sport at the back. Um, what happens now is it's my friends dictate to me what I read, my friends on Facebook, my friends on Twitter, they are, we, we've talked already about citizen journalists, I think we're also in a, a lot of citizen editors, so whereas um, when I joined The Guardian uh, uh, 20 year, uh, 18, 19 years ago, um, it was essentially a bunch of middle-aged men in suits who decided what we should read in our newspapers. They decided on the news diet. Today, the people who decide what I'm consuming in terms of news are my friends on Facebook, my friends on Twitter, my friends and contacts in LinkedIn. So um, 
there's a there's a really fundamental, and I agree with Richard. Of course, most of that is them pointing back to the traditional news outlets, the newspapers, the broadcasters. Um, but there's a subtle change going on in terms of uh, where we decide to uh, get our news. And the other thing about that, I think, that strikes me is we're becoming very niche in our uh, consumption of news. When we only had newspapers, uh, I'm sorry, you'll have to forgive me because my background is newspapers, so I will refer a lot to newspapers. But when we had newspapers as our principal uh, source of news, we we got a fairly balanced well depending <laughs> depending on what newspaper you bought, um, but we had a fairly balanced diet. So we would read the whole news, domestic news. We would read a little bit of world news. We would read a little bit of business news, and then we would read a little bit of sports news. I don't have to do that anymore. I can just go online and decide uh, that I just only want to read about my passion. So it might be a soccer. It might be uh, finance. It might be uh, you know a sub a sub genre of that. So I can drill down and read uh, what what feeds my passion. Do I then get the um, the broader perspective on uh, what's going on in uh, my locality, in my nation, in my world? Less so, uh, and particularly if you only are friends with um, people who share the same passion as you, um, then you get quite a you get, you get quite a narrow uh, focus on, on on life so I I have some concerns about that um, a couple of other things about the business model that uh, if I can pick that up um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about paywalls yet uh, but I do believe we are going through some kind of cycle it's very difficult right now to understand certainly in the UK where we are with uh, people's uh, willingness to to um, to pay for their news we're coming out of the deepest recession in living memory, so we're not quite sure what uh, is uh, we can we can attribute to a recession effect and what we can attribute to uh, people's uh, preference for for you know what they purchase. But I think at some point uh, we, we're getting used certainly to, pay, uh, to to getting all our news for free. I think at some point that will change as we realise that actually. Um, uh, we, we want to pay for quality news. Uh, we may have to go down a little bit deeper uh, where, to, to a point where uh, we, we recognize what is good news and what is not, not good news, um, what is well-resourced, uh, proper investigative reporting, and what is just uh, skim stuff. So uh, I'm hoping at some point, a bit like bottled water, I mean, if, if you had told us 20, 30 years ago that we would have paid for uh, a bottle of uh, you know, water, we'd have said, that's crazy. Um, we can get water free from the tap, but actually, um, over the last 20 years, the industry, uh, the, the water industry, has convinced us because they packaged it in a, in a great way. They've convinced us that actually bottled water tastes nicer and is better for us, and so on. I think maybe uh, as journalists, we need to uh, do the same kind of packaging job almost on news and convince readers that uh, it is worth paying for the, the good stuff. Um, so that's. That's that. Uh, I could say some more about that, but I won't. Um, and maybe a little bit just about um, citizen journalism. Um, I, as Sarah alluded to, uh, one of the projects I'm involved with is a is a hyper local uh, here in Newcastle. So, with a group of students, uh, each year we uh, train a group of students in grassroots reporting, um, and. Uh, working just in a very very small part of Newcastle, um, and um, what I would say, we we tried to we tried to run some boot camps for uh, local people as well, trying to get them uh, engaged in, in in some of the the skills of, of reporting and journalism, um, and I think it's given that has that's been terrific, and it's you know it's really worthwhile, but it's given me a greater appreciation of the skills that journalists have. I, you know, I was a big, and still am a big evangelist for. The, the, democrat, the democratization of news and the benefits that the internet and digital journalism brings so that we can all report news but it's also given me a greater appreciation of what we as professional journalists can uh, can bring to stories um, uh, the two have to work together um, anyway I'll, I'll shut up because I'll, I could just blether on about all kinds of things but Richard is that does that help 
That, that, that's great, Ian. Thanks. Let, let me just pick up a, a, a couple of points with each of you, and then we'll open it up to um, to the students there in, in Chennai to uh, to see what they want to follow up. Um, Sarah, can I come come to you first? And and you, you talked, and you've worked a lot, a lot of experience in this new area of community journalism, hyper local journalism that's opening up. And as you said, it's largely because of the kind of withdrawal of um, uh, commercial and traditional media for usually for economic reasons as much as anything. Is there, a, is there a difference or what is the difference in the kind of journalism and the kind of content that you get from a, a kind of grassroots community news operation of the kind that, that you've been involved in, that Ian's involved in, but are mushrooming here and in the States and, and in Europe certainly. Um, I'd be interested to hear where, you know, what the situation in, in India is, but uh, uh, certainly in, in Europe and in the States is a, a new phenomenon. What's the difference in the kind of news and the kind of information and the way things get discussed on hyperlocals versus traditional commercial media? I think there's um, there's two types really of of, uh, of output that we're we're perhaps looking at here. One is um, community sites that are set up to be a business to be a replacement news service to be on a footing and actually there there's less of those than there are of the other of the other sort which is uh, a, a place where people can gather around uh, you know in a local community and address issues that affect them and so in the in the first case you, you get um, some there are some good examples in the UK where people have set up uh, basically a, a news organization of some description. I'm thinking um, of one particular one in, in York in the UK which produces a magazine, a printed magazine, a glossy magazine and online and has a, a television channel. And the people behind that are very entrepreneurial. Uh, they didn't like the way news was done in their city, so they found it to be quite negative to actually focus on the bad things that were happening in the community, crime and such like. And so they set about with an agenda to show the good things about their, their city and uh, to use journalism to make social change. So they, they set out with a kind of remit, a kind of agenda and made a business around it and uh, um, are, are a profitable business that employs a few people. So, But they are quite unusual mm -hmm. and I think most of uh, what we call community journalism is more to do with people um, sorting things out in their local area. So typically you might see something uh, that appears across lots of different platforms. So it may be a very active Facebook page for instance and I'm surprised we haven't mentioned Facebook much yet. But Facebook has become the uh, you know sort of backdrop to a great deal of debate and conversation around issues, um, even if it's not sort of reporting in a traditional sense. And so typically with, with the more community-minded sort of groups, you'll find content appearing across different channels. Perhaps it'll be on a blog, but it'll also be in Facebook, it might be on Twitter. And um, that kind of diversity of output is something that's probably uh, more common amongst uh, community, uh, community publishers um, because they haven't got a commercial imperative to bring it all together and package it and, and present it in something that's going to be purchased anywhere or advertised on anywhere. You know, these are activities that are for the community, they're not for commercial gain. And so I think that's one of the uh, big differences, but we, we spot there's, a, there's certain things, certain trigger subjects that provoke um, a lot of uh, interest amongst uh, community publishers. Uh, transport is a big one, I expect that's a big one universally and probably the same way you are. Um, you can have uh, long conversations about bus routes and potholes and things to do with getting from A to B. Um, that, that's a very common theme. Things like uh, wildlife or the natural world, um, things that uh, in a community, especially urban ones, um, things like the um, you know the, the local park or the, the bird life there, and things like that, remind people of nature and, and the world outside. That's a very big universal theme, and and history. 
history of the place, history of the buildings, history of the people. Um, these are common touch points uh, across community publishers that are also you can spot in newspapers. You know, there's a quite often a nostalgia page in mainstream newspapers. Um, but the, the, they seem to be more so amongst community publishers who perhaps have found that touch point with people who like to say, oh, I remember when that street was looking like this, or share old pictures, etc. So I think those are probably the two sort of uh, areas, Richard. Yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. I mean, I do think it's, it's interesting that community journalism and hyperlocals are, are starting to redefine what's the news that interests them, and it's not always the things that commercial media has traditionally thought sell local newspapers. So it's less about crime or sensation and much more about the direct relevance to their lives. How do I get to work? How do I get the kids to school? What's happening in the local park? And, and so on. So, I mean, that's uh, I think that shift of agenda and a more relevant and local agenda is, is one of the kind of um, big things that's 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 happening at, uh, in local journalism at the minute. Um, Ian, uh, just to pick up on you, you made the very important point that, of course, it's great that particularly social media allows us to get news from our friends and therefore alerts us to things we might not have known about otherwise that it, we are likely to be interested in because if our friends are interested in it, it's going to be something that interests us and the rest of it. And that's a you know a very valuable new aspect of it. But you rightly say that the risk of that is that it, it cuts out lots of things that you didn't know you wanted to know or you didn't know you needed to know. And there's more and more concern that actually you know there's this narrowing uh, of, of people's exposure to news and information because so much of it it's simply from their own circle. Uh, it, I mean, the, the academics call it homophily, it's an echo chamber, it's this kind of the risk of narrowing down your exposure to news and information. I mean, what, how, how significant is that danger, do you think, in, in what we're seeing? I mean, great that we can find out what our friends can recommend to us, but actually we may not realize how narrow that is and how much is going on that we don't know about. Well, it, uh, that's a good, uh, very good question, and I think that you you, might, you talked about the word polarization, and that's what the web seems to seems to do. It, it allows us uh, people like Sarah and and, and myself uh, and others who are care about our local communities to uh, to focus on uh, that very very niche part of our uh, of our of our cities. So uh, so you know that that's a great thing, and it also allows us then to. Uh, comment and and take an interest in what's happening globally. Um, you know, so you know, I'm just as likely to see my friends who maybe live uh, at the other side, on the other side of Newcastle, uh, talk about something that's happening in Syria, and they have a viewpoint on that, and they want to comment about that, and that, and that's terrific. Um, but they may, because of uh, you, you talked about that kind of disappearing middle, uh, because they no longer buy. Say a regional news newspaper, they may actually be completely unaware about what's going on two or three streets away from them. Um, now I don't know if that's a if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, it's, I think it's it's just different, isn't it? it? It's it's right that we should care about uh, injustices and um, catastrophes and disasters on the other side of the world. We we you know we should be contributing to uh, that debate. We should be uh, doing whatever we can to alleviate issues like that. But we should also care about what's going on uh, on our doorsteps too. And um, yeah, I, I I don't know what the what the what the answer. I don't know. What, I'm not even sure what the question is because I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> that must be my fault. <laughs> I'm not sure whether uh, you know we're 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 doing more in one area, but we're doing less in another. So it's probably just a a, a, a balancing out. And newspapers, I guess, at least give us that kind of broad perspective. Take them out of the equation, um, and then we just, you know, we just seem to polarize into these kind of things that we're we, we're particularly interested, in, but not the other per peripheral uh, parts of our lives. I, I guess the worry is the social impact of polarizing. So on a on a globe, if you look at a broader political scale, in the states, people would say that you know because right wing Republicans only watch Fox News, uh, Fox News reinforces their views. Uh, that's polarized politics in the states. That um, actually people only watch the news that reinforces their own opinions, and therefore they have less tolerance for other people's opinions. And political debate has become, you know, a lot more aggressive and a lot more polarized as a consequence. And that may be a slightly extreme example, but you know, I suppose the question is: Are there social impacts to the fact that people only get the news that that you know their friends and they 
approve of or like or is within their their particular you know set of views and attitudes and you know is there a, a, a price to pay for losing uh, being exposed to all sorts of things that you you might not choose to necessarily see but it turns out you need to know uh, there's not an easy answer to that but it's definitely a, one of the effects of journalism in the digital age is this echo chamber and people kind of center around groups of views and attitudes that they suits them and there is a risk that maybe um, it's slightly a paradox, it's more information than ever, but actually people kind of huddle together a little bit more uh, in this environment, as I suppose what some people would say is one of the risks. And, and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe the fact that these people uh, coalescing around a certain issue means that we can move some of those issues forward quicker than we could have done before, so, you know, let, you know there, there is a benefit to, to that kind of concentration, but it's, it's those other issues that perhaps don't attract the same kind of attention that, that maybe you know um, languish without any kind of interest. Yeah, that you know th there may be a, a downside to those kind of areas. And of course, we've got the situation where access is an issue as well because uh, we're yeah. talking here digital. Um, there's even in the UK, there's large parts of the UK that are still excluded from uh, from being online or uh, having access to mobiles or whatever through either through financial reasons or or infrastructure reasons that in this country uh, even you can't get uh, broadband everywhere still and um, you know where, wherever you go in the world the, that that uh, exclusion of people is is going to be increasingly an issue especially if, if print products and uh, broadcast you know does die back yeah that, that that's a really important point sir and I'm sure also a really relevant point in, in in India so we've been talking for 40 minutes Dev, I, I think it's probably the time to, to hand it over to you and see if you've got questions from the audience there for us and um, maybe people could kind of say who who if it's a particular person they want to answer it or otherwise we'll just take it in turns yeah. uh, uh, thank you very much guys uh, the students uh, they're going to come here and sit here and uh, they're going to ask you questions uh, for the questions to individuals should I agree with you Okay. Hi there, uh, my name is Prana, and I guess my question is sort of for Sam. Uh, what do you think about, I mean, we, you talked about business models. What do you think of maybe even large news organizations moving forward with sort of not-for-profit business model maybe, or very minimal margins? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so what do we think about not-for-profit business models going forward? So um, there are kind of two thoughts. I'll be interested uh, in a set of, of experience on The Guardian, which is uh, a an, not-for-profit, although it would probably like to be for profit, uh, mm -hmm. news organization. Um, so uh, th there are is public, public broadcasting, which is my experience, and that's a state intervention. You know, a government decides to fund public broadcasting with a particular objective. Increasingly, there are, I think this happens in the States, there are foundations which are prepared to invest in a particular sort of journalism. Um, uh, it's kind of ProPublica and investigative journalism and public journalism and so on. If a foundation particularly thinks, thinks something is needed. And then The Guardian is a rather unique case where there is a trust set up to um, simply to uh, preserve The Guardian and ensure its journalism continues. And they've done that up until recently by having a very profitable. Uh, motor um, s selling magazine, Auto Trader, which they've just sold for a very good price and now have a big trust fund and a big block of money which should see them through for the foreseeable future. So they have a trust which is there not to make a profit for shareholders but purely to preserve the journalism. So these are all interesting models, um, but I, the, the other side that I worry about is that people say, oh well what we need is more non-profit news and there are all sorts of problems with commercial news, not least that it's, it's difficult to make a profit, but also there are shareholders, there are corporate interests and all the rest of it. We need more non-profit news. And 
I worry that that's not sustainable. I mean, there may be for public broadcasting with governments make the investment, and there may be uh, unusually things like the Scott Trust that looks after the Guardian, and there may be on a small level foundations that are prepared to invest in in little bits of journalism. But uh, personally, I worry when people say non-profit is the way forward because the money has to come from somewhere, uh, and I'm not sure that there is a long-term non-profit model of any scale that could easily be reproduced around the place. There are some things like the Scott Trust and so on, but I think that my personal view is they tend to be the exception. But I'll be interested, I don't know if uh, Sarah or Ian want to come in with that perspective. Um, yeah, actually business models is something I'm very uh, interested in. And I would just say that if there's anything, anything at all, that digital has effectively disrupted, it is the way we pay for things. Um, and so, really, why why wouldn't it be the same for journalism? I mean, in in the music industry, it's changed entirely from the way we purchase music, from you know albums with nice pretty covers, and to uh, just one track or a bit of a track even um, to downloads. We've got virtual currencies. The, you know, the the way we pay for stuff has changed for good, and I think it uh, has done the same. It has that same potential in journalism. Um, I've just uh, in, launched a, a new project, actually, which looks at a completely different payment model for journalism and journalists um, called uh, Contributoria, which is uh, looking at how to create a sustainable business model, which is member-funded journalism. So how this works is that journalists pitch their stories with a price attached to it of what they want to receive for producing this story. Uh, members of the platform, the Contributoria platform, have a look at them, they decide whether they, they want to support them, and if they do, they in aggregate back them, a bit like Kickstarter, it's a bit like Kickstarter for news if you like. So the idea of uh, looking at this completely different model is to try and find new sustainable ways of funding journalism that doesn't necessarily involve people buying a product or people advertising next to a product because um, in, in large part that model is pretty broken. Um, digital ad revenues are generally so low that they won't support uh, you know, enough quality journalism. So it, it's interesting, why, why wouldn't uh, our business model be disrupted, everybody else it has been, um, so we need to start investigating new ways of, of funding things. Uh, Ian, you want to on that? Yeah, please, Richard, if I can. So, yeah, I mean, we've, as Sarah points out, we've, you know, we've been working with this business model that is 200, 300 years old, you know, essentially classified advertising, display advertising to support the news, and that, that that's broken, so we need to be smarter at, at figuring out a, a new solution to that. I think I think the not-for-profit can sit alongside the for-profit. I think it needs to actually because I think w some of the problems and issues we've been discussing about uh, uh, perhaps areas that won't be reported on because um, you know uh, people aren't necessarily as interested in that as in fashion, celebrity, sports. You know we maybe need our public broadcasters, our publicly funded broadcasters to fill that uh, really important uh, void, so um, you know we do need to pay attention to that. But at the same time, you know we, we've never, as Richard again pointed out, we've never consumed more news uh, than we do today. So there's an appetite for news like never before. So it can't be rocket science to figure out how we uh, we, we um, get that demand to meet supply and, and figure out a transaction uh, that makes it sustainable. Again, Richard's right. I, I, I think it's only this is only going to we're, we're only going to be able to find um, sustainable models if they're uh, market-driven uh, models by and large. That's what's worked over the last uh, 300 years uh, in news production. We just need to find uh, a different way of of, of doing that. Um, so yeah, that's okay. Thank, thanks very much. Yeah, did you have any any follow-up question, or, or do we hand over to someone else? No, thanks, thanks. Uh, I guess someone else will come. Hello? 
Actually, uh, my question is completely related to business model. Uh, I want to start a new startup, so I don't have much money. So, if you could explain um, the crowd crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, how can I raise my funding and uh, its uh, impact, professional integrity, and news? Uh, how can I run and raise the Okay, so so you you, you are, if, I, if I got that, you want to start up a, a new service, a startup service, and you're interested in models that Sarah talked about, crowdfunding, and learning a bit more how that works. Yeah, Sarah, it's over to you. Um, crowdfunding basically works by uh, allowing uh, people to invest small amounts of money, but a lot of them to do it. So um, in uh, the US, there's a very large uh, site, Kickstarter, which you probably have heard of, where people can fund creative enterprises. So it, it could be something as simple as, I, you know, I want to uh, produce a, a, a series of uh, music uh, albums or a piece of artwork or something like that. You describe the project and um, people can can give just a very small amount of money, but if you get enough of, enough people to support you, your project is funded. So we took that principle and applied it to journalism, to uh, people creating a, an article. Um, so we, we've kind of built the business model around that, so that the members will pay for the work to be produced. Um, that, I mean, that's a new thing. We, we only launched at the beginning of January, so I can't tell you how it's gone yet. <laughs> We're only, like, uh, the first month in. Um, perhaps I'll come back to me in a year, and I'll, I'll let you know how that's gone. Um, there, there are, in, in the UK, if people want to set up news uh, organisations, um, obviously I'm only really familiar with the UK scene, there aren't any kind of set funding. There's no set funding. Uh, in America, the, there are some funding bodies, uh, but there isn't a sort of one-pot solution here. Uh, I don't know what it's like in India. There are open competitions. Um, we actually funded the prototype for the site I've just described to you um, with, with an open competition which was sponsored by Google, which took prize money to get things started. So it's worth keeping an eye out for these big international open competitions. Google are sponsoring quite a few of them. They're doing one about mobile at the moment. So it's a really a case of tune in to people that um, uh, you know uh, look out for these things and share them and uh, apply for them where they are appropriate. Uh, there are some big American foundations that sometimes the Knight Foundation is one that put up open international competitions where you can uh, get some funding to start things off if, if it fits into their current remit. But yeah, it's not, it's not e it's, there's not an easy uh, answer to give you as to where to go to find funding, I'm afraid. Uh, you'll end up self-funding it, I'm sure, uh, in part, because we all do, but yeah, <laughs> good luck. Let us know how it goes. Can I, can I make a suggestion, if that's okay? Um, which, which is maybe, oh, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, it, you, you, it may not be it may not be of, of any worth to you, but I would suggest maybe rather than trying to start up a whole company or an organisation, maybe start with one particular project and try and get that funded. So, for instance, with um, some of my students, we are trying just to get a. Richard talked about long form journalism and the and the uh, interest in in. Uh, long form journalism right now. We're trying to do something long form locally, just one a one off magazine. And we're going to use Kickstarter to try and get funding for that magazine. And then if that works, then we'll maybe try another one and, and so on. And it builds, builds from there, we, we're hoping. Um, I think the difficulty can sometimes be when you try to launch a whole organization and get funding for that and find salaries, and uh, you know, which is great to be ambitious. But maybe just you know take little baby steps first, 
do do one little pilot project, see if you can get funding for that. Is there an appetite for it? Do people like it? Um, and then build build from there. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, go, uh, some, some good, good advice there, I think. And now I'm going to try uh, and persuade you to use Contributoria to do that project now. <laughs> Uh, I have another question. You know, please. Uh, in the um, digital age, we are talking about a lot uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms. Uh, I guess the return of long term journalism is inevitable and it's coming. So, uh, could you please explain that one? Is the long term journalism, the uh, importance of long term journalism is coming back or not? I, I think it's um, the, at heart. This is about understanding where there's an audience and, and understanding what that audience wants. And and as I said in my in my thing, to some extent, one of the things we're seeing is that there's a, a market for instant news and breaking news. But we are starting to see more and more of an audience for long form journalism. And there are sites like Medium and Matter and it was long standing things like the New York Review of Books and other things. And actually, people. Are starting to subscribe to those, and um, I can't remember. It's, it's, I think it's Medium that is um, the guys who are behind Twitter are backing. Uh, but we are starting to see um, uh, a view that actually people will pay for longer form, immersive journalism and content, and so on as well. Now, whether that's a market trend that's really going to take off and establish itself, I think you know it, it's still an open question. But definitely, there's a lot of activity and interest in. in longer form journalism, whether people will be prepared to pay a subscription in order to get very high quality in-depth uh, content. So, Sarah, you if you wanted to come there's in a, there. There's just a, there's a, some interesting research that Quartz did on this, on story length and optimum sort of story lengths. And what they found is that articles less than 300 words and more than 800 words work. It's the stuff in the middle, which is about newspaper length articles that don't work. So, you know, digital is, is a new medium. You need to write for that medium. And uh, it, we all know people consume short and quick uh, upstate things, but they also do like to have big analysis pieces. So, um, if you're looking for a successful, uh, you know, a sort of um, uh, model for that, uh, it's either really short or it's really long. Uh, it's not sort of medium. Um, so it's it, you know I thought that research was really useful actually, um, and it shows the difference between writing for print and writing for online in yeah. a very obvious way. I, I hadn't seen that, uh, Sarah, but I shall go and dig it out after this because it, it seems to justify what I've been thinking for a while. So that's the answer is don't fall it down the hole in the middle. Be short and quick or long and deep, but uh, but yeah. not in the middle. And Rich is right about finding the the audience. We we, we are hoping that uh, we have an audience for what we're doing in terms of uh, our locality. So uh, in our region lots of uh, this short um, fast news but very little written in depth about our region. There's very little opportunities for readers to find out what's really going on in the northeast of England. Okay, we can get little bulletins or from our local news, we can read what's in the regional newspapers. But where do we go for in-depth analysis of what's going on in our region? Now, I'm not sure whether there's enough of an audience to sustain uh, a magazine, but we're going to we're gonna try with one issue and then test it from there. But yeah, you, Richard's right, you need to be sure that you uh, have an audience for, uh, for what you're trying to put out. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Hi, I'm Nikita. And my question is, um, do you think that the quality of uh, news that is provided is going down in a bit to uh, appease the digital audience? So is this a, a question of the quality or the type of news, and is it kind of a question of whether it's dumbing down? Is that what you're saying? The quality is going down? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't think that's true, actually. I think that, I mean, on, on the one hand, because there are more and more news services and, and websites and so on out there, there's a, people are striving for impact 
Um, but actually, because there is so much there, actually, I think overall there's more higher quality content available if you want it. Uh, I think BuzzFeed is an interesting example here. So BuzzFeed, do you, do you know BuzzFeed? Have you seen it? Yeah. yeah. So BuzzFeed is a, it started off as an entertainment site, and it has these listicles, as they call you know, 10 greatest whatever, or, you know, 20 best cat videos, or whatever it may be. Uh, and they have very tantalizing headlines that invite you to, you know, clickbait, invite you to click because you want to know the answer and all the rest of it. But having established an audience and, and built a, a, you know, a successful model there, they're now investing in international correspondence and serious news, and there's BuzzFeed World all about international news. Vice is a little bit the same. Vice as a, as a site came with a very particular strong attitude of, of kind of anti-mainstream media and very much aimed at a younger audience and some people say oh, it's a bit dumbed down but actually Vice do some of the best long-form documentaries and some really groundbreaking video journalism now. So I think what you're seeing is a lot of people are going for impact to build an audience but I think even those kinds of organizations are investing in serious high quality content as well and the other thing is that you know, of course there will always be dumbed down sites out there but actually there's an awful lot of very good material there as well. I actually think it's more of a problem for linear old-fashioned journalism and I think for newspapers and for linear television trying to maintain an audience in this digital world some of them are tempted to go for impact and sensation to try and pull the audience in. I know it's an issue the news channels that I've seen in India, for example, is that they're very quite tabloid and going for impact to pull people in, but they haven't got the opportunity and the variety of interactivity and the depth that online and digital sites can offer. And I think it's a bigger problem for, for old analog news services like news channels and newspapers who have to just go for, you know, trying to pull an audience in however they can. Uh, and if they didn't do something that audience doesn't like, the audience will go. So those are the places that I think are suffering. I think actually digital news operations uh, and and the kind of broader spread of what's happening online is I think very very hopeful and very positive. But I, I, let, let me see what the other uh, Ian or Sarah think. Um, I, go on, Sarah. Yeah, Ian first, then Sarah. That we go that way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think I worry less about the quality than I worry about the integrity of uh, journalism in the digital age. Let, let, if I can give you a couple of examples, um, just yesterday, because when I'm not um, teaching journalism and doing my hyperlocal, I freelance for um, some of the newspapers uh, and broadcasters here in the UK. And just yesterday, I received um, an email from uh, uh, a large American business magazine wanting me to be become a contributor and I thought great um, and then I, I said okay well you know how do, how's it, how's it going to work you know, what, what, about, what am I going to be paid essentially and uh, they were making a big pitch about well um, it's two hundred dollars uh, uh, a month we want five uh, pieces of work from you but the great thing is Ian we will be editing it you will just be able to put out whatever you want uh, now I haven't responded to that because I'm not quite sure about that model what worries me is okay I can, I can go on the web uh, be published on the website of this uh, large business magazine, American business magazine, uh, without anyone editing my copy. So, you know, part of me thinks that's that's great, but then the other part of me thinks, hang on a minute, where's the quality? Well, not quality control. Where's the integrity control in here? Uh, who's going to be checking what I'm writing that it's factually correct? That it's uh, that I'm not pushing one particular um, point of view and so on. Those, those normal conventions of journalism, we're we're seeing. Uh, slightly eroded. So that, that worries me a little bit. The other uh, example I'll give you is um, uh, the Financial Times asked me a couple of months ago to write about a, a social networking site um, and as part of the commission the, the, the editor said to me, uh, oh Ian you might want to check out this blogger. He, he's, he seems to write a lot about um, this social networking site. I, w I won't tell you who it is. Um, and uh, I thought, oh yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I read a little bit about what this blogger was writing and thought, yeah, this guy really knows his stuff. Um, he's a good guy for me to call. And, and uh, I kept, kept on reading his stuff. And then eventually I came to a bit of information that disclosed that he was actually a paid consultant to the uh, social networking site. Um, so you just got to be really careful about... Um, 
we, we've talked about business models, and there's all kinds of transactions going on in, uh, in, in the field of news that are somewhat transparent, and if they're transparent, terrific, then you know, we, can, we can follow the money and figure out who to believe and who not, uh, or you know, uh, who to question. But if sometimes those transactions aren't transparent, so um, I think my point is, um, yeah, we have we have greater breadth and greater um, variety of of news, and we have some. Richard's right. You know, uh, th those guys um, that are new to the to the sphere are doing some terrific work um, because they're putting money into it. Um, but that's not always the case, and we just need to, you know, guard. Uh, trust and integrity um, as journalists, uh, because that's essentially uh, what, what, what we have of value. Um, that, that's what makes us valuable um, uh, to, to the public. Great, great point. Very, very, very much a related point to what Ian said, actually. Um, I'm a lot less worried about so-called uh, clickbait uh, than I am about the, the influence of uh, big money um, PR companies and operators that are publishing as well alongside journalists um, and uh, the, you know the clickbait really uh, as journalists we should write interesting headlines that invite people to click them otherwise you know and that is what we've done forever and ever so I don't know why we use it as a disparaging term really because we're trying to attract people to what we've got to say um, there's no point in writing a boring headline that's not going to uh, get uh, somebody to look at your work. I think um, where, it, where it goes wrong is where the headline isn't related to the content that then follows, and um, you know that's just that's just poor. It's not uh, it's not new for the digital age. There's quite a lot of newspaper headlines that appear that actually are more arresting than the article might end up being. Um, and it's something that you know to be on guard for. But as far as uh, from a reader point of view, uh, if you're not sort of within the industry, it must be difficult, and there probably needs to be some education in media literacy here. Uh, it must be difficult to distinguish a very skilled uh, PR pitch, um, probably from an ex-journalist against uh, a, a well-researched article with no kind of uh, nothing to sell and no bias to put to it. I think that's going to be increasingly a problem. It's obviously something that Google have spotted, hence their change of the whole uh, principle of how guest bloggers are going to be treated in the future that they talked about uh, last week. And it's going to be an issue for all of us. You know, it's something the transparency of who the writer is and being able to investigate who that writer is and what, what they've got to sell. I mean, in some cases, the person selling something, it might not be a problem to you that you know that they're also writing about it. it might be beneficial because they know more about this product or service. But uh, it's the transparency of that, I think, is something that we should look out for rather than that dumbing down is perhaps not as big an issue. Great, great point, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Uh, yeah, uh, that's interesting. That's just about it. And um, thank you very much for being here, Richard, Ian, Sarah. Uh, we are incredibly lucky to have you on this panel, and it's, very, it's been very instructive and very educative for us. And we pretty much all of us enjoyed this very much. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, David. It's been a pleasure and very good to see you all down the Thank you. It's been fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, and thank you. Bye-bye.